When did you know you'd be writing Communicating with the Fourth Dimension? I didn't know I would be writing another book right away. I thought that the first two books that I did was enough. But one morning I decided to go for a walk with my dog Max and go to the river, which is in walking so distance. So the mist, seeing the water, hearing the water running, it, it takes you into that state of mind where you forget where you are. You forget that you're on planet Earth and you could just hear the water. So it was kind of like calling me. The river was kind of calling me. And it, it kind of puts you into a state where your mind is wandering a bit and you're recalling things. And then I start hearing a voice talking to me. And it's saying, write another book. And I'm saying, I'm not going to write another book. And it says, in a, in a very solid tone, no emotion, write another book. And I'm saying, no, I'm not going to write another book. It's too much work. But I know what's happening. Spirit is talking to me and wanting me to write what I'm now recalling and the memories and the things I saw, the things that you see, but you don't see, but you do see. And it was that type of thing. And from then on, I knew I would write the book. I'd be writing the book, communicating with the fourth dimension. You went to the California legislature for 32 years. You must take some special memories with you. I sure do. Um, I can remember being on the Capitol grounds and being there when Queen Elizabeth was there and getting to say hi to Prince Philip when he walked by. I remember working in Washington, D.C. and seeing President Nixon when he inspected the troop. At that time, it was illegal to practice astrology in California. And so I turned around and I tried to meet with the county and the Board of Supervisors relating to uh, getting something done to change the ordinance. I couldn't get anywhere with it. So I had legislation introduced by Assemblyman Zeber. It became law. It was signed into law and it separated astrologers from psychics, which I liked. And it gave them their own category and said they could practice for compensation. And so the, the state superseded the city and the county. And later when I retired, many, you know, many years later, then I was given uh, a Senate resolution. And in the resolution that was done up by the Senate, it was honoring me for having the legislation introduced and the work that I did, but talking about my interest in astrology, and that's kind of special. I still have that resolution to this day. Another example that, that to me was related to this fourth dimension and, and seeing something that somebody else might have noticed or that voice is talking to me and other realms want me to see something is when I was at work in I was very much into Native American tradition, studying quite a bit, reading a lot, reading about Native American medicine men. And one day I was sitting under the redwoods in the Capitol grounds and having my lunch. But it was getting close to my having to run and get myself back to work because my lunch hour was over. And so to the right of me would be the Capitol grounds. I was walking on the sidewalk hurrying. And then to the left of me would be busy traffic. And yet in my peripheral vision, all of a sudden I saw what looked like a enormous snake, huge, and I wouldn't look. It was peripheral vision. It was like, go to work, get to work. You can't be late, don't be looking for snakes. And that's when I saw the Indian grinding rocks. And when I saw it, it kind of upset me because it didn't stand out the way that other monuments do in the park. It didn't have the bench and the light. And so I knew why I was being called to look at the rock. What I was drawn to was the Native American energy that went into creating the, the grinding stones. So they wanted to be honored. They wanted to say, I'm here, come see me. And here was this little plaque and it said, acorn tree, acorns are important or something like that. Nothing about the grinding stones. So it wanted to be acknowledged. It wanted to be recognized. It wanted somebody to see it passing by. Start out your book painting clouds in your office. Can you tell me the significance of the clouds? I decided to do clouds in that room because I do astrology readings in that in, in there. That's my astrology office and I pictured, you know, sky, clouds. The clouds are important to me because it has to do with our creativity. When we look in the sky and we see a cloud and we get formations and we, we start making things out of it, our mind starts wandering and it goes to this other place where we get creative. It's like we're painting in our head. And so the clouds were really important to me because it helped me see visions and shapes and, 
it was like a portal taking me to the other dimension. So it served for that purpose. It was the main reason of the significance of the clouds. But it was like I was talking to spirit. I was in this place that was real special. And when I got done, I remember going over to this consignment shop that's on Colson Boulevard, not far from me. And I saw this chimpanzee. Again, it was like feeling coming from my heart. I wanted that chimpanzee. And he was supposed to hang on the ceiling. Like, why would a chimpanzee, a little monkey, hang on the ceiling? And it was close to the Buddha that's on the wall in there. And so when I looked at it, it was like, this is pretty unusual to have a room full of nice wispy clouds and then there was this monkey hanging from the ceiling. <laughs> so I was like, a car? <laughs> Why is there a monkey hanging on the ceiling? Now that I've learned I can ask questions. And he said, monkey mind. And I went, wow, monkey mind. And it, it's sort of a term that's used that kind of relates to Buddhism as well. They talk about it, the mind that jabber, jabber, jabbers. Mm -hmm. And so when I see the, the, the my little chimpanzee hanging from the ceiling, and it's not far from the carved Buddha that's on the wall in the clouds, then it, it goes together. And it's a reminder to me to watch out for the monkey mind. The singing bowls are very special to me. Those are out of, it's about 99.97 or something like that, quartz crystal. Mm -hmm. And when you take the bowls um, and you tap them, and you tap them in three places and then wrap your hand around them, they make a sound, and those sounds affect our different chakras. They're a vibration that goes out, and the chakras would be the energy centers that are in the body. The other thing that's significant with the singing bowls is the um, there's appetite crystals that are in, in our bodies, that's in our bones. These bowls, that when they vibrate, the sound affects the crystals that are in our bones, and there's millions and millions of these crystals, appetite crystals, in our bones. It was a drumming circle, a healing circle that would take place at, at Unity Church. And it was happening about once a month. And Michael Bayard, a master percussionist, was the one who put on. He studied at Juilliard, I believe it was. And he would work with shamanic drum beating and he would do different themes and it could relate to Egypt or this particular one that I was going to about the same time that it had to do with Africa. And um, in his productions, then he would have chants and people would be chanting through a certain vibration that he would suggest to them, this is the sound we're going after, then they would do the, the, the sound of it. And in these different productions that he did, there were visions that I would get while I was there. It was like I was taken into it. And one of the things that happened was um, there had been a lot of fires that were in California at that time massive fires that were happening down south and but we're doing the, the chanting and the drumming and we're in that little peaceful state of mind and all of a sudden it's like I was taken someplace else and I could see all of us that were there we were there because we came to listen to Michael and the drumming and be a part of it and but I could see all of us I had this powerful vision of all of us lined up side by side by side, standing at the edge of the universe. And we were, the sound that we were making is like that of the music of the spheres. It's a sound that the planets make. And we were singing to it and it was singing to us and there was a, a thing that was happening. We could go no further, but we stood together. And all of a sudden I realized we all have spirit guides. There's, there's, there, you and I are talking today. You have a spirit guide, I have a spirit guide. They can communicate with each other and they can give messages to us. We were gathered for that circle that Michael brought about because we were helping to heal the earth and we were helping to heal the fires. And so that's what was happening at a different level, on a different dimension. And it wasn't the first time that that happened. It happened again at a different time and it happened when there were mudslides and, and things that happened because of the rains over in Brazil where hundreds and hundreds of people were killed. And there, in that production when we were there and I was listening to the music and what was happening then there was a slide that he had on the wall and in it were rocks and they were much like the rocks that I saw at the river when I looked into the water and these rocks became skulls and they were they were they were souls they were people and they were lost they were like shocked they didn't know what happened one minute they're alive now they're dead 
And this chanting that we were doing and the sound that we were doing was helping to heal and release these souls so that they could go on. And Akar would tell me these things. He would tell me when I was in these, having these visions as to exactly what was happening and, and what I was seeing. And it was just very awesome. I read the book Autobiography of a Yogi by Paramahansa Yogananda when I was 19. The book showed me a philosophy that was very peaceful that I had never been exposed to before. It took me away from the philosophy of heaven, hell, being in a football field with God on one side of the bleachers and the devil on the other and they were vying for your soul. And so that was kind of peaceful for me. And after I read the book, it was always in the back of my mind to want to go to Ananda Village. But I thought that it was a long ways away in, in Tahoe and never went. For 40 years I never went, but it was my dream. One morning I was going to the grocery store and I saw a sign that said Ananda. There was an Ananda temple, three, three stoplights from where I lived. I never realized that and I'd been traveling down that street for three years. I went to the services. In those services, I started having visions, even more so, of the fourth dimension. In a couple of weeks, I was able to go to Ananda Village, which was really in Nevada City. And when I was there, something extraordinary happened. After lunch, a guide was going to show me the museum that's up there that has some of Paramahansa Yogananda's items in it. And I was following his truck. And when I was following his lead, because there's hundreds of acres there, I was following his lead down the road and the voice started speaking to me and it said ask the guide about the fire and then I didn't think anything of it I'm turning where he turns and following that road and voice did it again like it always did to me and it said ask the guide about the fire and just as voice said that all of a sudden this clearing there was the fire I saw the flames it was enormous and it wasn't something I knew anything of but I asked him I said do you know anything about a fire? Spirit keeps telling me to ask you about a fire. And he said there was a major fire back in 1978, I believe it was. And it was in the exact clearing I described to him. When I left the guide and drove back by the area where I saw the fire, I kept studying it. And there was you couldn't see charcoal, you couldn't see anything burnt. And yet I saw something that happened way back then. He said, I uh, take pictures of orbs. I want to take a picture of you. And I remember Sabra saying, yes, she takes great pictures of orbs. And so I'm gathered with these people, and I'm not thinking anything of it. Orbs, I think, are a form of energy. And so they take these pictures, and there it is. The orb is right on the solar plex in front of me, and I'm so charged that evening talking. And there's another picture, and it's right there with, with where I'm communicating, that these orbs are showing up. So, you know, I talk... Um, that's something that you can see. You can see these orbs in the pictures. What stands out to you about the last chapter of your book? The cha last chapter of the book is very unique. It's very special. I won't get into too much about it. But the reason that it was special is because I was no longer at the computer. I was going to bed, and it was almost midnight. And voices saying, get a lot of paper, a lot of paper. So I went and got a lot of paper and a pen. And I'm tired. I want to go to bed. And all of a sudden, I'm writing by hand. Everything is coming writing and writing and writing all this page after page after page and I fell asleep and just set the papers down woke up and I'm still writing and it was Akar communicating with me it was spirit it was like talking to God and it was telling me what's happening in the world today what the dark energy is what the fears are what the hope is and and it was absolutely awesome I knew it, my purpose in life I knew where I was in my spiritual journey I knew what had to change but there's a lot about the world and, and that's, that's written in that last chapter, so it was special. But my vibration changed and I was more receptive or something than, it, than it, there was something about having to do it by hand. And so that's, that's why that was so special. From the astrologer's perspective, can you share your take on what's happening in the world today? And how does the end of 2012 look for, look for the world? Yeah, the end of 2012, that really got a lot of attention from people. End of July or August, depending on, on it, it, it's around the middle of July, but it's July and August. Mars is going to go into Libra, and when it does, it'll hit Pluto, and it'll hit Uranus. Those signs, and there's something, there's a threat, and it's global. And it only lasts a week or two. I mean, it doesn't last very long, three weeks at the most, maybe. But it's scary, whatever's happening. is It's almost like the whip of the dragon's tail, one last hit to make your adjustments. 
and one of the last things to scare you when it blows fire. But right after that, things settle down, and you know, a little tidbit of planets maybe towards Christmas. But then it stops. Saturn goes into Scorpio in October. It makes sextiles to Pluto, I think it is, and trines to Neptune and Pisces. And that's favorable. That That's us relaxing. That's not us being on guard anymore. While we're on guard, we can't see the solutions. We're, we're, we're tense. We're afraid. We've been beat up. But when we relax, then the good things happen. And so the good is happening. The whole vibration is changing because the battleships of these planets and the aspects they made, they're falling apart. They're now waving to each other in the harbor rather than guns at each other affecting everybody's lives. So, But the marker of time is close to the same time. So there will be something that comes along where we either see good results of some of the things that have been put in place or something new comes along. So I have great hope.